25 years ago, um, the American political philosopher Francis Fukuyama published a book called The End of History and the Last Man. This was taken to, at the time to mean that um, liberalism, liberalism in terms of capitalism, freedom, market economies, but individual freedoms and liberties. You remember there was the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Uh, uh, there had been uh, Glasnost and Perestroika, and then eventually the breakdown of the Soviet Union. So at that time, this, this thesis was taken to mean that um, capitalism and liberalism had triumphed over ideology, not just a triumph over communism per se, but a triumph over ideology, that people were not going to th form opposing each other in blocks, uh, adversarial blocks, and that we were going to live in relative harmony with each other. Or so we thought. It's that narrative continued relatively unchallenged until 2008 and the global financial crash and the subsequent recessions that followed. Uh, since that period, we've seen a steady rise of uh, the right in Europe. And I want to distinguish here between uh, conservatism as we understand it in Europe and the rise of populist ideology, of nationalist ideology, of sometimes xenophobist ideology, of easy solutions, easy answers to complex problems. Uh, as Olli Schmidt mentioned in his opening remarks, that I have lost my job, but instead of looking to the state to give me a safety net, I look at my neighbor to say, you took it from me. I need to keep track of time. I'm not going to be very long. Um, so we thought that that, what uh, Fukuyama's thesis, the end of history, we, we understood that to be a demise of ideology. But since 2008, we've seen the rise of an ideology. I wouldn't call it clearly as the rise of conservatist ideology, but alongside the rise of conservatism, we've seen the rise of a rather nasty way of thinking. Um, but what is actually conservatism? A lot of people have defined it for you this morning, and I won't spend very long on that definition, other than to say that it is seductive. Of course it is. It's always easy to look back to your imagined past when so-called everything was wonderful, uh, the fruit was falling by itself from the trees, everyone was happy, and we knew who we were. But it's also, of course, a delusional ideology. Because what it does in painting a picture of a wonderful past is that it doesn't give us the framework that existed at the time that we think the wonderful past was. As somebody said this morning, uh, it was Mr. Yavlinsky, that change happens. Things change around us. And conservatives pull up, if you understand this expression, the duvet over their head and like to say, stop the world, I want to get off. Um, and of course, that isn't the case. When you hark back to an imagined past, you're looking, you're driving, as we say in English, you're driving with your eyes on the rear view mirror, not your eyes in the screen to see what cars are coming towards you. It's delusional in that respect. It is an ideology which is somewhat, as a liberal, I can say, bereft of hope, as it can't embrace the change that we need. Change happens, and we need to keep up with change, and it doesn't do that. But the dangerous thing is not conservatism of itself. The dangerous thing is when you combine conservatism with nationalism. And I know we're going to have a panel discussion on that later, so I won't linger too long on that particular issue, other than to say that 
the combination, the heady rise of conservatism with nationalism is what needs to make us liberals extremely vigilant. I'm not someone who's opposed to patriotism. I think that patriotism, a love of your, your motherland, your, your, your country, can be entirely noble. It can be entirely legitimate. But it is when you use the cover of patriotism as a cover for nasty nationalism, then you have to worry. I think it was said recently that a patriot loves his country, but a nationalist hates his neighbor. It is an ideology of the combination of conservatism and nationalism in this, is an ideology of superiority. It denies our place in a changing world, and it seems to kid us, again we come to the delusion, of, that only we have the answer. And history, friends, you know, is littered with nationalist movements that did not have the answer, that led to conflict, that led to upheaval, and certainly didn't lead to the progress of mankind. And that is where I fear that Russia is going today. There is a famous quote that we have in English, no man is an island, no nation stands alone. That's been a historical fact, that ourselves as members of society and community and our countries in alliances and friendships and safeguards and guarantees of security have, have not ever been alone. We have been in a community of others, with others. We live now in an interdependent world. Global trade and the benefits of globalization have lifted in the last 15 years nearly half a billion people out of poverty. It may surprise you here in Russia to learn that Africa in the last five to seven years sustained 6% growth year on year. That was due to globalization. That was due to trade, integrated markets, the flows of capital, investment into countries, liberalism combined with capitalism. In China, I came back from China recently, and it was evident to see, again, like Russia, I've been going to China for about, in fact, longer than I have been coming to Russia. Since 1976, I've been going to China. 300,000 people have been lifted out of poverty because, because China, uh, three, yes, mil, three, 300,000, uh, 300 million people have been lifted out of poverty because, chi because even China, even ideological China has embraced capitalism, open markets, although it hasn't embraced open society, but it has managed to do something with the, the liberal open capital markets that it has, has participated in a globalized world in. So we're interdependent. China has joined the World Trade Organization, as has Russia. But here we see now a return to even in economic terms, to autarkic thinking, to what I described a few minutes earlier uh, in my earlier intervention as predatory capitalism, as a capitalism that when either you are with us or you're against us, of a closed coterie of people who either have complete loyalty to the ruler on a, on a white stallion, Mr. Putin, or if they don't have absolute loyalty to him, then the law is changed to allow their companies to be taken over retrospectively. Charges are levied against them where there is a breakdown of not just a respect for the rule of law in terms of private property, but a breakdown of the respect of the rule of law in terms of what it means to be uh, uh, inter living in an interdependent world by the rules of an interdependent world. Um, if, you take, if you take Russia's response to these changes that we've seen in the world, abroad, Russia tears up treaties. It disregards international law. 
It disregards the sovereignty of its neighbors. It invades its neighbors. It, um, has, it wages war without having the courage to have its combatants, its soldiers, wear their national uniform. On the one hand, you have nationalism, and on the other hand, your, your soldiers have to hide their identity because, because that is the nature of the breaking of law. When the Taliban were uh, described in international law as, as unmarked combatants, we had a debate in international law about whether we could consider them combatants and therefore give them the privilege of the Geneva Conventions. Now we have a member of the United Nations Security Council emulating the tactics of the Taliban, how far we have traveled in terms of Russia. We have uh, a view of international relations in Russia, which is one of a zero-sum game. Russia wins, Ukraine loses. Russia gets Crimea, Ukraine loses Crimea. But that's not the way the world works. Russia has sanctions imposed against it by the rest of the world for this monstrous illegality. Russia thinks that it can push aside the rest of the world by having retaliatory sanctions. Who pays for these retaliatory sanctions? It's not the oligarchs. It's not Mr. Putin's friends. It's inflation causing. It's the poor people who will have to pay for it. It'll be the 140,000 ordinary, 140 million ordinary Russians, not the 100 oligarchs that Mr. Mr. Putin surrounds himself with. So you have this question. Quo bono, who benefits? Not Russia in the long run. It is delusional for him to try and suggest to his countrymen that this standing up for Russia's imperial past, its position in the world, is going to be in Russia's benefit. It is not going to be in Russia's benefits. The sanctions will not only be paid for by the poor people, but we've seen in the last year, since March, we have seen a capital flight of 120 billion rubles out of Russia. You have credit institutions and banks which no longer have the credit to lend your small companies when they want to set up, to support your entrepreneurs when they need help, to help people take out loans, to help people to get homes, to, to have a safety net, to invest their savings in productive capital. You have a rise of hostility tension in the world. Wars, it is said, are easy to embark on, but they're difficult to get out. Wars cost you, young Russians, not only treasure, not only your future, but they also cost you your blood. We know of the mothers who stand up because their sons who've died for the country, whose body bags are coming back from your western frontier, are not even given the dignity of affording the fact that their son's names can be known, that their son's name can be recognized. Nobody benefits when you have a country that backs the most unsavory regimes, such as that of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, that prevents not only international peace and security from prevailing, but actively supports more conflict in supporting 200,000 people dead in Syria, 9 million people displaced, barrel bombs, falling on civilian populations. Is that what Russia stands for as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council? Mr. Putin, you need to hang your head in shame, not run away to spend your birthday alone. Who benefits at home? You have the suppression of rights under the cloak of traditional values. Who's traditional? Whose values? Recognize science. Recognize that sexuality doesn't come in just one form. Recognize that the only relationship is not the relationship between a man and woman. There can be other loving relationships too. Who benefits when you suppress media independence and you do, do not allow your people to have access to information? Information, the most powerful basis of making rational liberal judgments. It is media ownership and information and you take that away from your citizens. The right to organize and to have free expression, to be able to express yourself through peaceful protest. What is there to be so frightened of, Mr. Putin, 
from your 150 uh, million citizens, that you do not now uh, allow them to organize freely, that you bring in laws stealth by stealth to prevent them from saying anything that might express the rights that they want to, to achieve. And then the rise of corruption. Who benefits that other than an elite few? So his policy continues, a policy either you're with us or you're against us. If we don't like you, we invent false charges to steal from you. The most fundamental aspect of democracy and capitalism, which is the rule of law, the protection of private property, is of course being eroded here. And not only will we steal from you, but then we will imprison you. Take Yukos or Khodorkovsky. But it's not only that, not only will we imprison you when we don't like you, we have the right to kill you. Sergei Magnitsky. Those of us who watch your country, those of us who fought for the Helsinki protections, look with alarm and sadness at how individuals who stand up one by one are now being wiped out, eliminated, isolated, persecuted. So it seems that a path of isolation is the choice that your rulers have made here at a time when the rest of the world is choosing to join together, to come together in deeper integration. That's what we're doing in Europe. We're integrating more deeply. That's in fact what China is trying to do. Even China, even mighty China, is trying to, have, try, trying to be included in the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement because it realizes it can't stand alone. But we have here a trend of isolation. But it was said earlier this morning, I think it was said by Mr. Yavlinsky, that Mr. Putin had said in his previous term as, as president, he had said, I'm not going to be here forever. I, I too will retire. Well, I can only say to you, friends, bring forward your retirement age in Russia. Bring it forward to 65 so that you know what the end is and that you know you will be free of him in a limited number of years. Nobody is invincible and nobody will live forever. You will have your freedom. You liberals have to stand together. You liberals know that we're with you and we will continue to be with you. But things will change. Isolation never continues forever. Thank you very much. Thank you.